Let us pray. Father, I want to thank you for this time where we can gather as a family here in CCR. Father, as we look to your word, open up our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us. Help us to understand your love for us, your grace. Help us to understand your truth. So Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us, Lord. In Jesus' most wonderful and precious name we pray. Amen, amen. Church, good morning. All right, wow, that was a very good response. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> we are improving. So, have you ever doubted? Right? Have you ever doubted for many things, like, not just scriptural, but uh, may, have you ever doubted? Have you ever given in to doubts about certain things or whatever, like, about life? Right? Or maybe when you're praying, also your prayers uh, have gone unanswered, and then you doubt well, whether God exists. And, uh, or sometimes when you suffer, or a loved one suffers, and then you doubt whether God, is he good? Right? And uh, we all struggle with doubt sometimes, I'm very sure. And, um, and most of the times we cover it up because we don't want people to look down on us like we are weak Christians, weak people because, you know, you have given in to doubt. And if, uh, also because maybe you feel that if someone knows that I am doubting, they're going to think I'm a bad Christian. And uh, so we try to cover it up most of the times. We try to cover up our doubts. So we don't even talk about our doubts at all. But to be honest, we all do doubt sometimes. Right? Not just about life, not just about our future, but even about what the Lord has promised, what the Lord has said. We do sometimes give in to doubts. I do. I have. And when you look at the scriptures, the poster boy for doubt in the Bible is... Thomas, yes, is doubting Thomas, right? Unfairly uh, given that title. And it's easy for us Christians living on this side of that story, right? We have hindsight. So living on this side of the story, it's easy for us to look down on Thomas. And then uh, like he is somehow less intelligent or less religious than us, or he's less of a Christian than you and I. It's easy for us to say that. But I don't think that uh, that's accurate and or fair. So, if you were to stand um, in the shoes of Thomas this morning, if you were to stand in his shoes, right? perhaps you and I are more like him uh, than we would like to admit. Uh, so, it is, um, is it too difficult to blame a man who has been told the ultimate, unbelievable uh, story? Right? That Jesus, who had been put to death, brutally he was put to death, had come back to the grave. So can we doubt Thomas for his skepticism, for his doubts? I think we all, to some degree, can identify with Thomas, lah, if we were in his shoes at that time, 2,000 years ago. What would you have thought if you were Thomas? Would you have believed after seeing Jesus brutally nailed to the cross, after seeing him uh, giving up his spirit, after seeing him die? Would you have believed if someone were to come and tell you, Jesus is risen? So remember, uh, Thomas saw uh, at that time, right? He saw, for those who watch the Passion of the, Passion of the Christ, we know right, how brutal it was. Uh, the very, um, uh, very gory, bloody portrayal of the death of Jesus. Thomas saw that life. And it hurt for him. And it hurt him to see Jesus like that. And when you're hurting... My friends, it's sometimes hard to believe. So doubts usually come about when we are hurting, when we are suffering, when we are in pain, when we are struggling with things. That's when doubt tends to slowly creep into our lives. So, my friends, once again, have you ever doubted, like Thomas, have you ever been asked to walk by faith and not by sight? Right, as people come and ask you, your loved one dies and that hurts and now you're supposed to believe that he or she is going to rise from the dead again in the future. You feel pain in your life. You're confused and you're worried and upset and you don't know how things are going to work out for you. You're supposed to believe that Jesus is God and that he loves you and that he's watching over your life. Have you ever doubted? I need proof, you say, like Thomas. I need a sign from God, like Gideon. 
You pray and pray and don't get the answers you're hoping for. You want God to show you something to prove to you that He is real. You know, friends, sometimes doubt can be a destructive force. Uh, it may erode our confidence in ourselves and even in God. And since Thomas's doubt is recorded in detail here in Scripture, let's look at who he was and see the causes of doubt and how we can uh, maybe reinforce our conviction and not only that, also articulate with our own lips, with our own words and also with our very lives. So who was Thomas? Right? Who is he? It's a shame that some people are remembered only for their mistakes. Have you ever felt like that? People only remember you for your faults. They forget all the good things that you have done, but you're only remembered for your mistakes. Thomas, can you imagine that? Forever living down one failure or blunder in their life? So it was with Thomas. But many don't remember that Thomas wasn't the only one to doubt, you know. The other disciples didn't accept the resurrection at first. Uh, when the women came uh, with the news that the tomb was empty and Jesus had risen, right, they did not believe, Scripture says, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. Yet Thomas, yet of all people, Thomas is the one who forever bears the label doubting Thomas, not the doubting disciples. Right? Doubting Thomas. He's singled out. Maybe the reason for that is because we don't know much about Thomas, uh, whose name was Didymus. Didymus actually is also Aramaic and uh, Greek. Didymus and Thomas, it means twin. Right? He's twin. So, uh, were it not for the Gospel of John, we would know nothing, you know, except uh, he was one of the 12 closest disciples, followers of Jesus. But we have two quick snapshots of him uh, that are worth not, uh, seeing. Because I believe they help us understand why Thomas reacted the way he did to claim that Jesus had risen. First, we see in John 11, uh, where Jesus was called back to Jerusalem due to the illness of Lazarus. We saw that a few weeks ago. Uh, scripture points out that the disciples tried to discourage Jesus from going to Jerusalem. Because everyone knew that the religious leaders wanted Jesus dead. So after some discussion, Jesus simply says that he is going. And in verse 16, it says, Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. That shows us that Thomas was the kind of person that had probably a pessimistic outlook in life. You can, you can just hear it in his statement, right? It was good that he was loyal to the place of being a martyr. He was ready to die. Right? It was good. That was good. But he was so very negative about uh, the intended outcome. He was probably saying, you know, well, obviously, Jesus is not going to listen to us. Lah. He's not going to listen to us. So we might as well go with him. And uh, I'm telling you, we're all going to die. That's probably what Thomas would have said. Come, lah, let's go, let's go. Let's go and die with him. Lah. That's it, finish, you know. So he was, in a way, pessimistic in that sense. So, uh, and Jesus says in John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. I will come back and take you to be with me. You know the way to the place where I am going. And it was Thomas who said, Lord, right, we don't know where you are going. It was Thomas who said that. Thomas said, uh, we haven't any, what Thomas was trying to say this, like, we don't have any idea uh, where you are going. So how can we know the way? That was what he was saying. Then once again, uh, this gives a little insight into Thomas that he had probably a skeptical spirit within him. The way that question is constructed, right? it says, Lord, I don't know what you're talking about. Be more specific about where you're going. Tell us exactly where you're going. He couldn't understand. It was just not in Thomas' personality to accept, accept things at face value. He struggled a great deal with uh, simply accepting Jesus at his word and therefore the promises of Jesus. Now, if it is your basic nature to be skeptical and see things as half empty, you know the half glass, the glass half full, half empty, if you're looking always uh, it as half empty. Uh, so depending on where you are in your spiritual walk, so there's going to be some things that are difficult for you to believe. 
If you're just getting started on your walk with Jesus, you're a new Christian, you may find it hard to accept or trust all the promises. If you have been walking in the faith for some time, for many years, and are negative in nature, I've seen very negative Christians, eh? they call themselves Christians, but very negative to the promises of God. You may have a difficult time experiencing the joy of walking with Christ. But you know what? Nowhere, absolutely nowhere, will you find a more positive message that Jesus offers. A message that promises purpose for the present and hope for the future. So if you're like Thomas, you need to realize that you're being robbed of the potential for yourself. And this morning, Jesus might be saying to you what he said to Thomas in verse 27. Stop doubting and believe. So I don't know what doubts you have about the promises of God, about your future. But let me remind you what Jesus said. Stop doubting and believe in Jesus. Now, Understanding Thomas from these two incidences, uh, incidents makes it easier to see why he acted the way he did after the crucifixion. I think it may even explain why he is not there at the first appearance of Christ. Right, scripture says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So we don't know where he was. Right? But I believe, based on his character, whatever little we know about him, that he probably made the same mistake that a lot of people do today. In his low time, in his low point, in his confusion and in his doubt, he withdrew from the place and the people that he needed the most. So, to give Thomas some credit, uh, he did not um, cut himself completely off from the disciples now because he knew he, he was there the following week, Sunday. But Thomas's character also shed some light on why he refused to believe what the disciples told him. Thomas was the kind of person that said, show me. And so when the disciples say that they have seen Jesus alive after he had seen him die, he basically says, you expect me to believe that story? Really, are you sure? No way. I saw how Jesus died on the cross and there's no way he could have come back alive. Not until... I put my finger in Jesus' nail prints and my hand in his side. Will I believe? Now, remember this isn't one person's testimony that Thomas was in a way challenging. It's 10, right, of the most trusted uh, friends. You know, what, you know what I would have said to him? Hey, Thomas, are you calling us a liar? Right? It's not like just one of us has seen him, you know. Mary has seen him, Peter has seen him, and the two on the road to Emmaus, right, they have seen him. We are telling you, your friends, we are telling you, we have seen him. He was here in this room. I may have been angry with uh, Thomas, upset with him, because you know why, as friends, he didn't trust me, he didn't trust what I say. Or I could have been frustrated with him also. But Thomas remains stubborn, and he refuses to believe. Then the next Sunday, the following week, Thomas is there. And I think no sooner uh, than Thomas arrives, Jesus also arrives, right? And uh, passing through that locked door, through the walls. So Jesus, I believe, looks right at him and says, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it to my side. Okay, I, I doubt Thomas even stretched out his hand and then uh, I think... He probably fell to his knees immediately and confessed, my Lord and my God. Thomas may have been slow to believe, but once he did, there was no doubt. He knew who he was looking at. So, why Thomas doubted? Why did he have this question? Why did he doubt? What was the cost of his doubt, his skepticism? And why don't we live lives that consistently demonstrate our faith. Let me list a few for you, four acts. Um, maybe probably unexplained uh, circumstances. See, it's human nature for all of us to be skeptical of things we have never seen or experienced. Right? If you are inquisitive, you want to understand how things happen. See, Thomas was probably a pessimist. But before we are too hard on him, uh, let's admit that most of us, right, 
Don't accept a supernatural explanation very readily. Right? When a healing takes place, sometimes we doubt. We say, Are you sure that healing took place? When a person was delivered from a certain addiction, certain habit, so are you sure that person was delivered? We have our own doubts over supernatural things. But you know, many things that we thought were intellectually impossible 30 years ago are commonplace today. How many of us here would have believed eh, when someone told you, maybe in the early 90s, late 80s or early 90s, I'm not sure how many of you here were born, right? If someone will tell you, in the future, my friends, you will hold an electronic device in your hand that will be a handphone, that will be a camera, that will be a video uh, recorder, and computer even, if you like. How many of us would have believed that if I've told you in the late 80s or early 90s, hey, everything is here, man. We would have doubted, right? We would have said, no. And what we have said, I will not believe it unless I hold it in my hands and see it for myself. Right? You probably said that. Repeated scripture. How many of us would have thought we, would have, we could have ordered things online and not even having to leave our houses, right? You can stay at home and order stuff. How many of us would have thought that? Right? I don't think so. So all these changes has come about because of, our, of an increased knowledge. And since there's, that's true of our human existence, that's why in Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah writes like this. He says, who can fathom or who can understand the spirit or the mind, eh? uh, certain translations, of the Lord, or instruct the Lord as his counsellor. You see, God has superior knowledge and power, so anything is possible for him. But because we can't explain it sometimes intellectually, we doubt it. Because I cannot understand it, I can't uh, uh, write it out, I can't explain it, therefore, we want to doubt. we rather doubt it. So, Circumstances could have given a rise to our doubts. The next is probably unjust suffering as to why we doubt. You see, um, when unexplained suffering happens, uh, like the recent earthquake in Taiwan, right, uh, or the wars between uh, Ukraine and Russia, or the war in Gaza, right, where the innocent are suffering, or the sudden death of a well-known Christian minister or a pastor, or when a loved one uh, is struck with a serious disease uh, or terminal disease. These things can shake our faith. And we ask, how can God be all loving and all powerful and allow this to happen? How can God be so quiet when he sees all these things happening? We give in to doubt. And people who begin with a false concept of being a Christian will protect them from all disasters. Some of us start like that. Being a Christian, I'll be protected, shielded from all harm. These people will be prone to leave the church and forsake the faith when unjust suffering occurs. Thomas believed in Jesus. Jesus was the best man I'm sure he had ever seen, the Son of God. Yet, here he is in the place where he sees Jesus being crucified as a criminal. So Thomas' confidence in the justice of this world must have been destroyed. See, unjust, unfair. He was probably delusion and like us, doubted. But sometimes when our dreams are crushed, if we can just keep an open mind, God can lift us up, my friends, if we will just stay open to him. And the third thing probably was pride. And this could be the primary reason, right? When you look at verse 25, Thomas says, unless I see the nails in his hands and I put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side. I will not believe. You can sense a tone of uh, defiance or pride in, this, in those words. He did not say, if I see him, not even if I see his wounded body, I believe. He said, I will not believe unless I see the print of the nails and put my hand in his side. Thomas was too smart to believe this craziness, right? If you can say it's craziness. Jesus begged from the grave, Come on, who are you trying to kid? Who are you trying to fool here? Right? We all want to impress others with our sophistication and intelligence. We want to prove to people that hey, I'm a very reasonable person, that I, I'm, I'm very intelligent, so I don't believe in all this stuff. 
Sometimes we take pride in accepting something that is not rational because it's not the in thing to do, right? Pride. And the last cause of doubt uh, may not have applied to Thomas here, but um, surely it applies to us, and I believe it is unconfessed sin. You see, unexplained circumstances and unjust suffering brings on intellectual doubt. And probably earthly ego, pride, brings on prideful, brings on doubt also. But unconfessed sin brings on moral doubt. People rebel against uh, God's uh, will for their lives, and they feel alienated from God. So David knew what it felt like when he wrote this. There was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was, but my dishonesty made me miserable and filled my days with frustration. You see, rather than admit our sin, and be held accountable, some of us express doubt about the existence or the validity with God or the Bible. Doubt becomes a convenience. It's much easier to doubt than to change, right? I'd rather doubt than have to change from my sinful ways. So what brought Thomas from doubt to conviction? Firstly, He openly admitted his doubt. Now, it is important to understand eh, for us that asking questions is not wrong. It's not wrong for you to ask questions. Honestly, if you seek, honest seekers always ask questions, but they don't just leave it there with the questions. Honest seekers will investigate, will do some research. And uh, and in honest investigation, if you honestly investigate, you will find the truth. Thomas had the courage to express his doubt. And if we are going to deal effectively with doubt, we must learn to articulate it, must learn to say it, express it with our words. But remember, it must be expressed honestly eh, and humbly. It's hard to admit when you're wrong. But the first step in getting rid of doubt and finding uh, faith is to humble yourself before God and ask questions, but ask honest ones. Right? Uh, when we openly and honestly admit, I know I'm supposed to believe, but I have questions. My friends, we are on the way to breaking the chains of doubt. So openly admit your doubt and honestly and humbly seek the answers. Second is this. He put himself in the right place. Thomas put himself in the right place at the right time to find the answers. The first Sunday night after the resurrection, Thomas wasn't there. But it was only when he was in the right place that his doubt was removed in the following week. A week later, he, uh, his disciples, Jesus' disciples, were in the house again, and Thomas, that's right, uh, clearly, right? Thomas was with them. So I cannot em- emphasize this strongly enough. If you want to strengthen your faith, if you want to climb out of the darkness of doubt, you must expose yourself to the light. Right? Time after time, people struggle in their faith. I have struggled in my faith many times. And instead of staying in the light of God's truth, in light of God's teaching, And the fellowship of God's people, they tend to withdraw. They move away from the church. And it gets darker, you know, my friends. By being gone that first Sunday, look what Thomas missed. eh? He missed out on the fellowship with his friends, the common bond they had that could have strengthened him. He missed out on the instruction that Jesus gave. What what, uh, must it have been like, you know, to hear Jesus tell them about his death? What an amazing experience that would have been. But Thomas missed out on that. Luke 24 says, right, Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Thomas missed that. So it can all be summed up by saying, being gone that night, Thomas missed Jesus. And if a person says, I'm not sure I believe or I'm not sure I'm growing in my faith, and yet they seldom go to church, seldom come to church, and they seldom read the Bible, seldom spend time with God's Word, or they don't get involved in a cell group or fellowship meetings so they can associate with committed Christians. My friends, then their doubt or your doubt is self-imposed because you're staying away from the light. You're staying away from the truth. So the next time the disciples got together, Thomas was there. He wanted to believe. And Jesus appeared. And what did Jesus say? Thomas, you cynic, you pessimist, you man of no faith. I've got no need for you, so please get out of my sight. Right? And say, Thomas, 
He didn't do that. He didn't scold or correct Thomas. No, he was very, very patient with him and said, Thomas, come and touch my nail prints, my sight, and don't be faithless, don't doubt, but believe. So if you want to have a strong faith, you must be willing to honestly investigate the truth. The other thing about Thomas that Thomas did right was that he articulated his faith. He said as he had surrendered himself to the living Christ, he said, my Lord and my God. And with that he was saying, it's true, I believe. And that is why testimonies are important. Sharing testimonies with one another is also very important. Hearing testimonies are also very important for us. Fellowship, during fellowship. But notice, Thomas said this out loud. My Lord and my God. So one way to reinforce our faith is to express it in the presence of others. And that's why we have it uh, during baptism and confirmation also. Confirming our faith in God. Thomas did that because he realized he didn't have all the answers, but he knew Jesus did. So he surrendered his, his intellect, his uh, skeptical spirit, he surrendered, and he also surrendered his pride. Everything that he had and found the living Christ. So what do you need to surrender today? I'm not sure whether do you have doubts. We, do we believe everything the scripture says? Do we believe everything that God said? Or do we doubt certain things? Is it pride that we need to surrender? Is it a wrong attitude, a wrong spirit that we have? Is it sin? Is it because of sin that I cannot believe certain things? Now, Thomas was wondering if all the reports about the resurrection of Jesus could be true. He was having trouble believing that, but in the midst of his doubt came Jesus to meet him. So there are those out there who will try to tell you that to have doubts is to reject your faith. They will try to tell you that if you have doubts, then you can't say that you have faith at all. If you have doubts, you cannot say that you are a follower of Christ. Those who say those sort of things are forgetting that we are finite human beings, right? We have our own flaws and weaknesses and our own struggles. We don't know everything. We don't have the answer for everything. We don't always know how things work. We can and don't know the mind of God. We don't always understand the ways of God. I believe that God enjoys our questions and our doubts from time to time. I've had a lot of doubts in the last few years, last five years, and even more in the last two years. Many doubts. But I've learned to bring that before God and say, Lord, I don't understand. So Lord, I surrender them to you. And I know that God in his time will help me to understand. But I've learned to surrender my doubts to God. So that is where, in surrendering, in surrendering it, that is where God can meet us in order to set us straight, to answer our questions and to increase our faith. I believe that doubting can, in fact, lead to greater faith. If you are willing to listen to the Holy Spirit and seek honest answers, not just live the doubt like that. Remember that it was only after Thomas took his doubt to Jesus that he was able to come to the place where he could say, my Lord and my God. If you have questions about God, don't be afraid to take them to God in prayer because Jesus will meet us in our doubts and lead us to greater faith. So for those who have doubts, what is causing your doubts? Unexplained circumstances? Unjust suffering? Pride? Or unconfessed sin? But will you surrender this and believe? And as the worship team comes up, uh, prepare for the response song. I want you to take this time, uh, and as the worship, sing, worship team sings the song, to bring before God your doubts, whatever they may be. He's not going to be offended. Right? Your doubts about the ministry that you do, doubts about God, doubts about His promises or what He has said in Scripture. And I want you to, as we sing this song, to bring it before God. He's not going to be offended. But even in your doubt, when you don't understand what is going, going on, when your prayers are not being answered, when you are in pain, when you're waiting for God to act, will you still believe Him? That He will take care of all things? Will you believe that God can do the impossible? Because nothing is impossible for Him. Bring your doubts before God.
For you, our doubts, even our unbelief, oh Lord, we surrender them to you because we know, Father God, that you are the true living God. Even when we doubt, Father God, that we are walking alone, 
even when you have doubts whether you're walking with us. Sometimes we doubt, Father God, will these prayers be answered? We doubt, Lord, is your word true? Will your word come true for me? We may have doubts and say, Lord, will you really see me through this situation? We doubt, Lord, is there really light at the end of the tunnel? Lord, will you really help me out of this situation? Lord, will you really bless me? Or because of our shortcomings and sins and flaws, we doubt God and say, Lord, do you truly love me? Am I really precious in your sight, Lord? Do you really love me as I am? But I want to remind you, my friends, that God is real. He is walking with you. There is light at the end of the tunnel for you. He will see you through all your situations. Don't doubt because he will never leave you nor forsake you. Believe that He is with you and His promises are true. Jesus says, stop doubting and believe. So my friends, will you surrender all your doubts before God? And in exchange, will you believe? Whatever you're doubting for, will you believe that Jesus will see you through? Father, we want to thank you that you are a faithful God, that you are real, O oh Lord, in our lives, that you are present in our lives, that you are present in our journey, in our walk, that even in our pain and, and, and sufferings, in our struggles, Jesus, you are real and you are present. You are there with us. We don't need to face our situations alone because you are present. You are real. And we thank you, God, for that promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And so we surrender all our doubts. And in exchange, Father God, we believe. So help us to believe, Lord. In Jesus' most wonderful and precious name we pray.